Good morning and welcome to VetNet and our Project Management Career Perspectives live interactive webinar. I am H.F. Lerkowski and I will be moderating today's session. Uh, after 11 and a half years on active duty as an engineer officer, I transitioned to the Army Reserves where I've continued to serve since 2010. After leaving active duty, I spent over four years as a project manager with GA Braun, uh, industrial laundry equipment manufacturer based out of Syracuse, New York. Uh, in 2015, I joined the IVMF, where I've spent my first year as the EBV program manager and my second year as the O2O program manager. Uh, the past year, I've uh, spent serving as a project manager uh, here in support of all of our programs and services at the IVMF. Um, actually, currently uh, enrolled in BCTP and pursuing my uh, PMP certification. Uh, today, we are pleased to have several special guests with us uh, that bring a wealth of experience in project management. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Dan Cohen, uh, joining us from right down the street here at Syracuse University. Dan is a Army veteran, former IVMF team member, and certified PMP. Dan is now working as an enterprise process support project manager here at Syracuse University. One of the many projects that Dan took on while here at the IVMF was the creation of the O2O program. So thank you, Dan, for that. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Joe Pollard. Uh, Joe joins us from Charlotte, North Carolina, where he is currently serving as the return on learning lead at Accenture. Joe is an Air Force veteran and is PMP certified. And I'd also like to add a uh, proud father of twins born over the, this past weekend. So congratulations, Joe, on that. Uh, next, I would like to introduce uh, Amy Zhao. Uh, Amy joins us from the National Capital Region, where she is currently serving as a program manager for ACOM. Amy is PMP certified and brings over a dozen years of experience in project and program management. And last, but certainly not least, I'd like to introduce Rich Fifield. Uh, Rich is a retired Army major with experience in aviation maintenance, logistics, manufacturing, and electrical utility project management. Currently a senior project manager with National Grid in Syracuse, New York. Uh, Rich holds his PMP and is serving as the PMI Syracuse chapter president. Uh, Elvis Abdick uh, will be helping me monitor the YouTube chat channel throughout the course of this session and introduce any questions that come through to our guests. Uh, if you have any questions to ask, please make sure you take advantage of that chat function in uh, YouTube. Dan, Joe, Amy, and Rich, I am glad you guys could join us today, and I'm looking forward to spending the better part of the next hour gaining your perspectives in project management. Uh, we'll now give each of the guests a chance to expand uh, on some lessons they have learned as they've entered or progressed in their project management field, uh, as well as cover anything I may have missed in their brief introductions. So, uh, Dan, I will turn it over to you first. All right. Well, hello, everyone, and thanks for having me. As AJ mentioned, I'm Dan Cohen. I'm a PMP and I work as an IT project manager on the campus of Syracuse University. In my role, I oversee three to five projects at any given time, which range in duration from three months to three years. In my work, I oversee teams varying in size from a few staff members in one small unit to several dozen members of the Syracuse University community from all over the campus. I do a fair bit of procurement, including writing uh, RFPs and managing vendors. I've managed the implementation of both on-premise and cloud-based software solutions. And sometimes I also pick up enterprise process improvement projects that are not necessarily rooted in IT, uh, such as implementing an information security framework. I also teach IST 345 managing information system projects at our School of Information Studies. In my past life, I served as the Director of Distance Education Programs at the Institute for Veterans and Military Families, uh, where I was responsible for the Veterans Career Transition Program Boots to Business, and VetNet. In that role, I was also on the team that stood up Onward to Opportunity, as AJ mentioned. Uh, prior to Syracuse University, I spent five years in operations management within the supply chain for Kohl's department stores, uh, where I lead, led a team of about 200 associates. And finally, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, I was an officer in the great US Army Field Artillery. I was commissioned on August 30th, 2001, served on active duty with the 1st Armored Division until 2005, including a deployment to Iraq, uh, reorganized as mech infantry, and then a mobilization off the IRR in 0708, during which I was deployed to Iraq again as a foreign military advisor uh, on a MIT team or military transition team. I resigned my commission in 2009. It's been great working with my friends at IVMF to be a part of today's event. I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. Joe, we'll turn it over to you next. 
AJ, thank you, sir. As you mentioned, I'm the return on learning lead at Accenture currently, and that is a curious title that many people wonder what it means, but effectively what I do is manage the $1 billion investment in our people at Accenture that uh, we make in learning each year. So that's the excitement of my day to day and um, in terms of how that integrates with what the topic of today's conversation and project management, there is a never ending stream of projects, programs and so forth that we are managing to bring that $1 billion investment to the fruitful conclusion for our stakeholders. Uh, prior to my time in this role, I uh, was originally uh, came out of the University of Kansas as a bright spanking new second lieutenant and was quickly deployed to uh, Minot, North Dakota, where I spent four forgettable years as a nuclear launch control officer. I went back to school and got my MBA from the University of Tulsa and then got my PMP in 2009 um, as I was working on some pretty intensive, like pretty by the book type project management programs for the federal government related to um, the NRO and launching spy satellites. And from there, uh, I joined, uh, that was at the point there, I joined Accenture and have been doing a variety of roles, including uh, software development, um, some, I, some other IT infrastructure management and so forth. Um, that, uh, I think AJ, you covered everything else. My latest certification, of course, was as a father to the twins that AJ mentioned this weekend and just really honored to be part of this group. So AJ, thanks for t making the time for me. Awesome, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, Amy Zhao, we will turn it over to you next. Great, well, uh, good afternoon, AJ and everyone. I'm Amy Zhao. Um, I'm a program manager at AECOM. I've been with AECOM for, and a predecessor company for um, 17 years now. Um, AECOM is a global engineering and infrastructure corporation um, with a big presence worldwide, doing a lot of different things all over the world. Um, I support, um, Intel and foreign language programs for U.S. government customers. Um, I've supported programs um, located both in the U.S. and overseas. Um, I have a science background originally, and I started my career as a Peace Corps volunteer in Senegal. Awesome. Thank you very much. Welcome uh, and good morning from the National Capital Region. So Rich, uh, Fightfield, last but not least, we'll uh, give you a chance to introduce yourself here too. Thanks, AJ. My name is Rich Fifield. Uh, I started my career out, uh, well, the first 22 years of it in the Army. First half of that in aviation maintenance, um, on the Blackhawk, crewing, um, quality control. Uh, then I moved on to, uh, went to OCS. I spent the next uh, 10 years or so as a logistics officer. Um, and then rounded out my career with a couple of years as an information operations officer managing the information engagement program for the brigade during a deployment to Afghanistan. Uh, transitioned out in 2012, went to work for GE Aviation on Long Island, uh, spent a couple of years there, um, came back up to the great north, uh, northeast up in the Watertown area, worked for uh, uh, New York Airbrake. Uh, doing new product development as a project manager there. And currently I am a project manager with National Grid, an electric utility company, um, doing um, operational infrastructure work, new substations, distribution lines, work of that type. And uh, I'm excited to be here. Thank you again for uh, allowing me to participate. Awesome, thank you very much. Appreciate that, Rich. Um, so moving on here, uh, I will now pose a series of questions to our guests, uh, asking their advice and perspective on, a ver on various topics surrounding project management. Uh, I just do want to put a reminder out there that if you're watching uh, via YouTube chat, uh, that you can type additional questions in through the chat function. Uh, I see some coming in already, so I think you guys are figuring that out. Um, We'll go through uh, some prepared questions here, and then at the end, we'll open it up to some of the questions that came in through uh, YouTube. Uh, hopefully, we're able to answer some of those questions here and what we have prepared. So um, the first question uh, here, and uh, Rich, I'll let you lead us off, but in your eyes, uh, what skills are the most important for a project manager to possess? 
Thanks. Um, I, I would say that uh, there would be little argument that uh, the two main skills are, are communication and organization. Um, the, uh, the communication as the, as the first skill is, is uh, probably the most uh, detailed, wide ranging uh, communication within your team, uh, and communication with your stakeholders, um, and in all forms to include uh, the, the never ending paperwork that comes along with uh, just about any, um, uh, any job out there, uh, reports, making sure that you're uh, uh, communicating with your leadership in your organization or those uh, other stakeholders or who have an interest in understanding uh, the progress of your project. So communication. Um, organization, um, I know uh, the other panel members uh, and I, we all have multiple projects going on at the same time, um, and you need to have a detailed way to, uh, to uh, maintain um, information on your project and to be able to um, track that. Uh, be able to differentiate your projects because it can get confusing at times when you have multiple similar projects at multiple stages. Um, so I, I would say that definitely communication is the highest priority. Uh, make sure you're communicating well, uh, the hub of information and sending it out to everybody who needs to know that information um, and organization to make sure you're in control of where the potential uh, gaps are, where the risks in your projects are that you can identify before they become issues. Awesome. Uh, Dan, I see you unmuted. Do you have something to add? So um, just tied directly to the communication, I think as a function of that, the interpersonal skills that are a big part of communication. You work with new people all the time. Personalities won't always mesh naturally. And as the project manager, it's still your job to keep the ship afloat and handle that. Uh, so that's conflict management and resolution, uh, but also in addition to just written and oral communication skills. Awesome, thanks. And Joe, I see you unmuted too. Absolutely, I'm excited to add here. Uh, so those two, uh, the two responses so previous are spot on. And what I like to do is lump all of those together. And what I would be looking for in terms of the skills of, of a project manager are finding a balance in all of the above. So Dan talked about interpersonal skills. Um, you can bring someone in who's got great interpersonal skills in some contexts and not others. And as we all know, no project, no two projects are alike, no two project teams are alike, no two clients are alike. So the ability for, and the skill of a project manager to come in and find the balance of, am I communicating too much? Am I communicating too little? Am I blindly sticking to the project plan too closely without being flexible enough? Or am I too flexible and you know completely ignoring the project plan? Um, being, being able to find, kind of use the sliders to fine tune how you're going to apply you know, all of what we've already discussed to the situation is what I find most valuable and, uh, as a skill for a project manager. Awesome, thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, next question is, when bringing a new project manager onto your team, what are your expectations of that project manager? How do expectations change with certifications such as CAPM or the PMP? And I'll open this up to Amy first. Yeah, this is a great question, AJ. I think um, when I bring a new project manager onto my team, um, my expectations are that that person will be um, willing to take on anything that the project needs to be successful. I mean, a project can take all different shapes and forms, um, and each project is different. Um, some need uh, more attention put on the technical aspect of the project or on cost management or on quality. Um, projects are in different stages. There can be at the beginning, at the middle, or at the end at, at closeout. So I need a project manager who's willing to take on um, the project in whatever form uh, in whatever form and shape it is at that time. And, and someone who's willing to take responsibility for the project, um, whatever condition it's in. Um, someone who is a self-starter, um, someone who considers themselves to be a problem solver, and someone who's willing to learn. Um, so you just never quite know what you're what you're going to be inheriting. Um, so you need to be ready to to take it on and, and be take responsibility for it. Um, as far as um, expectations with certifications, you know, in my in government contracting, um, if I have someone on my team who's um, PMP certified, then that makes me feel like that person is invested in being a manager, invested in being a pro project or a program manager. 
um, that they, um, you know, my all all of my peers and all of my managers all have PMP certifications. It's really a requirement. I wouldn't be able to have my job without um, being PMP certified. So if anyone is interested in getting into government contracting um, and being a manager and um, having a career in government contracting, I think um, being PMP certified is, is a requirement. So if I see someone who has that uh, certification, then I would feel like they're ready to, to make an investment in this kind of uh, career. Super. Thank you. Uh, Joe, I think you're unmuted, so I think you have something too. Yeah, uh, similar to Amy's, the initial part of Amy's answer, um, my expectations of a project manager is that I will never hear the words, that's not my job, come out of their mouth. Um, if, what, if the critical part of the project right now is sweeping the shop floor and cleaning the bathroom, then that's what I expect the project manager to do. Now, if they're doing that every day or every week, then that's another conversation. But the expectation, at least initially, is that you know those words, that's not my job or that's not in my scope of work, is not in, in uh, their vocabulary. In terms of the expectations with the certifications, uh, Amy put it great in terms of it, it's different from a, from a government world to a commercial client. Um, the government qualifications will frequently have you know, a PMP certification listed in a, a role description or you know, something of that nature. On the commercial side, it, it's a little bit different. But what I see when I see a project manager that's certified, either CAPM or PMP, my, my first expectation is that they're going to be able to, to use the vocabulary that they've been taught and the structure of you know, the content behind those certifications to communicate in that language. That's what I think it brings to, they're going to bring at least initially. If I get somebody who's not certified, then you know, the expectation is exactly the reverse and we're going to have to teach them and bring them on. So that's, that's what the real angle for certification for me is, is that I don't have to start from, from fresh. They're, they're coming with not only the project management experience, which is what you know, the PMP is going to validate, but also lending some credibility to the, to the uh, vocabulary and being able to, to communicate in, in that content. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, anything else from, from the group? Perfect, okay, I will move on to the next question then. Uh, next question is, based on your experience, what skills have you found to be most helpful across industries or positions you have held? And Joe, we'll let you start off with this one. All righty, this is, this is a simple answer to somewhat can be a complex question, but the skill that's helped me the most is learning to keep my mouth shut. Um, just shutting my mouth and listening to either members of the project team, members of you know, sister teams that are working in tangent with us, or listening to the client will help me every time over opening my mouth. So especially when I'm new to either a client or a project, I make a concerted effort to keep my mouth shut and absorb more than try and project any ideas that I have. Awesome. Anybody else have anything to add to that from the group? Amy, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, sure. I mean, I would add to that. Um, I think um, leadership skills that are include being an ethical and honest leader. Um, AECOM places a big emphasis on ethics. Um, so if you have that as in your toolkit, then you, you'll always be successful. Um, believing in your team and celebrating their successes and their good work. Um, trying always to be a positive role model for people you're managing and, and trying to be an effective communicator. Um, as far as technical skills, um, you know, if you're a project manager or a program manager, you're expected to wear a lot of different hats and be successful in all your different roles. But I think in particular, um, being strong, being able to be strong in financial operations and financial management um, is a real bonus. And um, then always um, understanding your customer and what they need. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, Richard, Dan, anything to add, guys? Rich, I see you're unmuted. I, I would like to add, you know, certainly they're all um, excellent points and I agree with them all. Um, one of the values um, throughout the organizations, um, you've got your managers that manage the individual departments. Um, and a, as a project manager, the value that we bring uh, is when um, 
when there's a potential for gaps between the departments. So it's, you know, all of the departments can be doing um, a, a great job. Uh, the individual team members are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, but if you if you don't have somebody there to make sure and to anticipate where those gaps may be, uh, to uh, avoid those potential issues, um, and really just the uh, um, the understanding of the overall process to a level necessary to make sure that you can facilitate it, and the um, um, and the ability to ask questions and to ensure that. Um, you know, you're comfortable asking questions in front of the group and getting the proper answers to make sure that um, the handoffs are happening as they're supposed to. Awesome. Thank you very much. Those are all great, great responses. Um, we'll shift on to the next question. Um, what is your approach to managing multiple projects simultaneously? And we'll open this up to Dan first. Sure. So. I know some people who try to dedicate fixed blocks of time to certain projects. I found that to be unrealistic. The world doesn't revolve around my schedule. Uh, with that in mind, I found that everything boils down to communication. I maintain a calendar on the network and that's use case exchange and keep it up to date. I let my stakeholders know that I manage multiple projects and that my calendar is up to date. So there's a little bit of expectation management that takes place there. I use the enterprise project management software solution, in our case, Team Dynamics to keep our project schedules and resource requirements documented. And essentially I focus on the project integration tasks uh, that allow me to stay organized. It's all about documentation. I force the team to have a scope that is agreed upon in a charter. Integrate change control is absolutely a must. Uh, changes need to be documented and prior to approval reviewed across not just your project schedule and budget, but also across the portfolio to deconflict any personnel and other resource availability, availability issues. Uh, I log issues and risks uh, uh, weekly. I review them and log them weekly. I keep my issue logs and risk registers in JIRA, but any number of tools can be used, the simplest being Excel. I hold weekly team meetings, monthly sponsor meetings, and send bi-weekly status reports to the executive sponsors in order to make sure we all stay on the same page. So this allows my sponsors and the CIO and the portfolio manager to see how issues cross impact other projects, including mine and make deliberate and well-informed decisions across the portfolio, not just any one project. All these practices and the level of organization and documentation ultimately allow me to manage my time efficiently and switch gears from one project to another about as seamlessly as a simple human can hope to do. That's it. Awesome, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, anything else from, from the group? I just you're muted. Yeah, one of the one of the challenges, um, you know, without getting into uh, portfolio management, but uh, here at National Grid, um, the engineers, the um, the operations uh, team members, uh, there's um, members across multiple projects. Um, you know, he, uh, he had mentioned that um, communication is important. Really, the communicating within the um, within the team members and understanding how uh, there's conflicts within their resources. Uh, on, as they're working on other projects that I own, as well as uh, projects from other projects, project managers, uh, to ensure that there is prioritizing going on um, almost daily on uh, where the resources are, and um, ensuring that um, you know time critical tasks are getting prioritized above those that might not be as sensitive. Uh, Absolutely, it boils down to communication to make sure everybody understands what the resources are available and uh, what work needs to be done and the priority it needs to be done in. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, Amy and Joe, you guys have anything for this one? Okay. There you go. Amy, I think you're unmuted. Just more of what others have said about trying to stay organized, um, keeping checklists of things, just to try to uh, manage the project very pr practically. Um, you could have a command center that everyone's working off of. Have really frequent check-ins with members of your team because if you're if you're managing multiple projects, then you probably are working with team members, and you need to be able to depend on them too. So those types of things, documenting everything, try to help keep um, things a little bit organized. Awesome, thank you. 
Um, okay, so we'll move on to the next question here. And uh, this one is, can you describe your most challenging experience with managing a project and how you dealt with that experience? And Rich, we'll open this up to you first. Thanks. Uh, certainly, uh, I'm on a communication theme today. My most challenging project, the, the situation was um, I had multiple departments, uh, nine different departments that were working on this project. Each of them were fairly siloed in the organization, uh, very little crosstalk between them, but every one of them had an integral step in uh, accomplishing the project objectives. The um, Additionally, uh, the, the project work or the, the type of work done in, the, in this particular project was considered relatively low priority. So what I need, needed to do was I needed to ensure that um, communication was happening across departments, that I was bridging those gaps and I was building those bridges so that they would continue without my direct involvement every time it needed to happen, um, as well as change the um, uh, change the attitude uh, of the people in the project to say that this is a this has now become a priority where historically it's been a relatively low priority so when I engaged the team and I brought the team together I took uh, a couple of different approaches um, the first thing is is I made sure that every team member and every manager in each department understood how their piece affected the entire project. It was really about communicating and making sure everybody understood how important they were to the project. Um, and that got the managers involved in what needed to be done. And that um, really built the relationship and um, empowered the managers and the work, uh, the, the team members themselves uh, to uh, seek out those uh, those gaps and either bridge them themselves or bring it up uh, to me or their manager to ensure that um, that those gaps were bridged. Um, and it it worked out quite well. Um, I've got all of the departments uh, talking. I've got them all engaged. Um, I got them to uh, really start talking beyond what they were used to, um, moving the um, sense of um, uh, sense of priority or, or uh, the sense of importance um, is is slow um, as you're getting it's it's essentially changing a culture a part of the culture within the organization um, and really I found that that is something that needs to be done very deliberate um, and it's through communication and involving everybody on the team so that they understand how they fit in it's uh, it worked out well um, and we were able to uh, successfully meet the requirement uh, in particular uh, in the time that we needed to Awesome, thank you. Anything else from you guys? I'll take a quick swing at that. Um, without getting into too many details, I was managing the implementation of a procured service. We'd gone through a robust requirements solicitation process that uh, involved stakeholders uh, from all over the campus uh, community and uh, written an elaborate and very specific request for proposals or RFP. Uh, selected a vendor uh, through a well-managed competitive bid process, negotiated a contract, and started work. It was a fixed-cost contract, so the risk was all on the vendor side. problem came when stakeholders started creeping the scope or wanted to include more than our contract specified. That's normal and would be fine. Uh, you just prepare a change request, get a quote from the vendor for the additional work, get it approved as an addendum to the contract, and drive on. A uh, team, including some senior stakeholders, wanted to just get the vendor to do the work without a change. You can't really bootstrap vendor's effort the way you might your internal team's effort. So um, ultimately, the vendor did do this exactly what we did without a change, but the additional work chewed into the hours the vendor had allocated for the work later in the project, which ultimately resulted in some quality issues. Uh, we'd call this out as a risk early on. The team chose to move forward as we did, so we documented the issue and the outcomes of the projects and lessons learned and we moved on with life. And I, so I think that there was the positive that came out of that was that there was a lesson learned and in future projects and procurements, we're a little bit more deliberate about uh, documenting change and basically integrated change control in general. Awesome, thank you. Amy, Joe, you guys have anything? 
I'll take a crack at it, AJ. Perfect. So um, in the organization I currently support, we have 430,000 folks and growing. And each one of them, I like to call them our 430,000 special snowflakes. So Rich was talking about uh, prioritization earlier, and we have a consistent challenge. Uh, the structure of our organization has changed over the years. We used to be a partnership. We've moved into we're a publicly traded company now. So the, the every priority that we get in any project I manage is the most important priority of anything out there. And so we constantly have to communicate um, kind of what Dan was saying, like, right, you can't have just change request. You do a change request, you can you can uh, amend the scope of the project, but at some point, right, you have to stop because otherwise it's just change request after change request after change request. So, you know, one thing that we have to constantly communicate, it feels like we're butting our head against a wall or beating it against a wall is, you know, we understand, and to senior leaders as well, we understand your, your perspective, we appreciate and value your leadership. You know, how can I delicately, delicately tell you that we're not interested in pursuing your idea or your uh, your course of action. So that's always a challenge. It's something that's not just project specific. Uh, it happens to be more prevalent in, in the current environment I'm on, but it, it's something that the faster that you that you can, can kind of learn those skills and learn how to not trample on egos that very likely exist, especially as you um, gain experience in your project management role, it, it will certainly help you. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll move on to the next question. Um, this question is, what advice do you have for transitioning service members and spouses on resume writing specific to pursuing opportunities uh, within project management? And Joe, we'll, we'll open this up to you first. Sure. So I, I think my first tip is don't beat the word project management or separately project and management to death on your, on your resume. Uh, if you're already PMP certified, you're likely already obviously putting it at the top of your resume somewhere, I would I would hope or, or assume. So as you go through, you know, in your listing out your experience, you know, I was a project manager, I project managed, I was the project management lead. Like you just you're going to it gets old and tiresome real quick and I'll stop reading and just say, OK, this person's really into project management, which is fantastic. But I haven't been able to tell what they've actually done because they've just beat that word to death for a page. So, you know. Stated up front, okay, I get it. This person's either certified or they're pursuing certification or they're a project manager of some kind and, and that's what their interest is. But then stop and let me know, you know, how the experience fits into to that word kind of. Awesome. Anybody else have anything to add to that one? Rich, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, the um, I would add that uh, it, when I transitioned out of the army, one of the one of the biggest challenges I had was um, ensuring, as as was mentioned earlier, ensuring that I was using the proper the language and the terms that everybody expected uh, um, me to use in a uh, project management or really any type of role outside of the military. Um, you know, even at the, the stark, con stark contrast of, you know, an, an operations order, uh, an op order in the military is essentially a project. Two completely different things uh, when you're looking at it from either uh, from either standpoint, operations is not projects. Um, one of the things that I that I found useful um, in learning the language and ensure that I had the terms um, appropriately applied on my resume is I essentially did a um, a search of every posted job out there that was in line with um, in line with what I wanted to do the, the job type the job title that I was looking for um, read through the job description ensured that it was uh, relevant to my experience and um, relevant to what I wanted to do I took several job uh, postings I dropped them into a word cloud generator and I pulled up the prominent relevant terms, uh, ensured that they were applicable to me um, and put them on my resume appropriately. Um, a lot of large companies, they do their first screening uh, electronically. And, you know, certainly you can uh, abuse the heck out of a title. Uh, you don't want to say project management 30 times in a document. It's, it's well overkill. Um, 
But if if you're not putting the appropriate terms on your document, in many companies, it'll never pass the, uh, the electronic screening for a person to even review it. Um, so that's a technique that I used to ensure I was using the proper terms, I was learning the proper terms appropriately, and I applied them appropriately in my uh, in my resume. Awesome, thank you, Amy. I see you're unmuted. Do you have something to add as well? Yeah, I, I would say that when I'm um, reviewing resumes for um, of candidates who are look at going after project management um, positions or, or other types of positions. Um, I'm looking at the resume and in my head just trying to draw a really quick connection between what I see on the resume and what I know I need, um, the type of person and the types of skills that I need to have in the person um, on the position that I'm trying to fill. And so if, um, if I or other people are reviewing resumes and we're not very familiar with military careers, um, I think it's helpful if people um, quantify things on their resume, like if they were in charge, if they were managing, they were a people manager, you know, how many people on your on your team were you managing at a time and, and in different ways? And if you were managing um, a, a program uh, and a budget, you know, what was the value of the of the program that you were managing? So just trying to um, translate a little bit from the military side to the um, to the private sector um, by quantifying things, it makes it a little bit easier for for us to to read them. Awesome, thank you. Um, so we're gonna do one more of the prepared questions and then we're gonna shift over to the uh, the YouTube because it looks like we do have some uh, questions coming in there and then we'll come back at the end if time allows for uh, some more of the prepared questions. So um, next question here, uh, in your opinion, what are similarities and differences between project management and program management? And we'll open this up to Dan first. Sure, thanks. So uh, program management means different things to different people. To project managers, usually program management means the management of related projects under a single program to drive efficiencies or something along those lines. That said, program management can also be synonymous with operations management in some circles. Uh, for example, in the academic units on campus here, the staff member who oversees an academic program is generally called the program manager. That said, I'm going to focus on program management as understood by project managers. Uh, similarities between project and program management include that you'll spend much of your time creating and updating documentation, deconflicting resources, and resolving issues. Also, um, you're accountable for something, whether it's a project of related work packages or a program of related projects, you're the accountable party. Uh, the primary difference between project and program management is the level at which you're viewing deliverables and resources. As a project manager, you're working directly with doers, individual contributors, coders, stakeholders uh, who are demanding work to be completed. You know exactly how every dollar is being spent. As a program manager, you're working with project managers and are relatively disconnected from the individual contributors, or in some cases you may be, or do the product sponsors expect, accept it as necessary to resolve escalated product issues, uh, make executive presentations. Uh, you're aware of how your products are performing in terms of cost and schedule, but don't necessarily care that a project had to buy two extra computers, which was fine because the savings have been realized elsewhere, so the total equipment costs of the project were consistent with the baseline. It doesn't really matter to the program manager. It's just, is the project hitting its cost goals or isn't it? Uh, Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, anything else from the group? Amy, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, I agree with what Dan said, and um, I would also say that um, I read a helpful analogy to help understand the difference in the roles of project managers and program managers. Is One way to think about it is to think about it as engineering versus architecture, where you may have an engineer who's involved in the detailed planning something, but the architect is more concerned with the design elements. So likewise, you have your project manager who's more tactically focused, focused on completing the project, um, who manages and coordinates tasks and activities, but the program manager um, is responsible for being more strategic. Um, he has to focus on the big picture and meeting a strategy or an, any other kind of bottom line um, benefits like a growth or productivity. Um, and the program manager needs to lead and facilitate teams of, of the project managers. And, and I would add also that, um, you know, just like um, moving up from being a team member to being a project manager 
or from being a project manager to a program manager, um, the things that made you so good as a at your current job um, aren't going to be the same things that are make you so good at your next your next level up job. So it's a learning process. Um, you have to learn different skills. Maybe you're, when you're moving from being a team member to a project manager or a project manager to a program manager, it's really a different skill set that's involved and. And it's a learning process. Um, it takes a while, but um, but it's exciting. Awesome. Anything else from the group on that one? Okay. So we're going to shift over. There's quite a bit of dialogue going on right now in, in YouTube. Um, I was reading through it, trying to extract some of the actual questions. Um, one of the ones that jumps out from early on uh, is basically for, from somebody, uh, uh, Mary Leak, and she asked if, uh, uh, basically, if you manage aspects of a project, but you weren't like the dedicated project manager, could you count those as project management experience uh, when going for your PMP? Um, I don't know if any of you guys, Rich, with your PMI <laughs> leadership, maybe you have something to add on that one. Sure. Um, as I... Uh, project contributor, certainly your experience counts. Um, you don't have to have to be eligible to sit for the PMP. You don't have to have um, all of that time as a project manager. You do need to have experience in all the areas um, as required by the PMP. And there is an expectation that you are a project manager for a certain period of it. It's not, um, it's not um, broken out by what percentage that may be. Um, but when they evaluate your application for a PMP, it's uh, the total application and your experience uh, is that um, equate to uh, an experienced project manager who can sit for the PMP. Thank you. Anything else from the group on that one? Well, I've seen a lot of a lot of led a number of people through getting their PMPs and submitting their applications. And most of those folks don't have titled project management experience where their actual job title was project manager, uh, but they will ask for the hours to be broken into the five uh, process groups, initiating, planning, executing, monitoring, controlling, and closing. And if you can, in good conscience, said you led certain elements of that project through in those five process groups, then you can document your hours in those periods of time. But, uh, Awesome. Thank you very much. Anything else from, from you guys? Okay, there's another question here from uh, Keyshawn Blakes. And his question is, what jobs help prepare people who, who aspire to get project management experience uh, and hours to eventually get uh, SIP for the PMP certification? So, this is Joe, AJ. Um, the one thing I try to avoid is worrying too much about titles. I'm here in Charlotte, which is the banking capital of the Southeast, which means everybody here is a vice president of something. Um, so what I would what I would look for in terms of, if, you know, as I'm going for my PMP and as I'm trying to progress through, through the, the project management um, profession is to continuously expand uh, upon three dynamics, the scope of work that you are involved in actually managing. And by managing, I like to just say, basically, if that scope doesn't happen and the other two are going over budget and managing resources, physical resources, either people or um, products or some of that nature, in any of those three dynamics, if, if what is supposed to happen doesn't happen, you are the one that gets in trouble. That's that's what I would consider growing um, those areas. So, I mean, if you start off, you know, you're flipping burgers and and that's your scope of work. That's great. Like, but constantly expanding that, you know, now you're in charge of the whole grill. Now you're in charge of the restaurant. Now you're in charge of a series of restaurants and continuously expanding. That is what I, I would look to do and the experience that I, I would suggest in terms of rather than looking for a title like, you know, I'm a whatever you you want to make, you're a director or a manager or a associate manager, you know, we can make those up and give them to anybody. Awesome. Thank you. Anything else from the group on that one? 
Yeah, actually, I'd um, I'd like to uh, contribute. One of the one of the challenges, and uh, as I've worked with um, different people on their PMP application, um, really understanding the difference between a project and operations. Um, you know, at its simplest form, uh, a project is something that has a beginning and an end and, and a deliverable in the middle. Um, operations uh, at the opposite end is a um, you know something essentially that you you have a um, you have a process you follow the process um, you, maybe you follow the process uh, over and over again um, maybe you're just following the process once um, or a few times but it's a uh, that's operations so when you're looking at the experience that you have or the experience that you are trying to get um, look for uh, those positions where essentially you need to uh, bring people together to a deliverable um, and how that fits into the process groups as uh, PMI has identified them to ensure that you can flow through a process and you can show that you are you are working on a project rather than working um, in an operational type role. Awesome. Thank you very much, Rich. Um, okay. So another question that came in as well, uh, somebody asked if, uh, when, when I, I'm assuming it, the context here is when looking at a resume, if somebody has a PMP certification or somebody has a PhD, um, I'm assuming in a related field, uh, which would you guys value higher? Joe, see you. Yeah, I'm trying to think of how to put this politically correct. Um, it, it depends on the role, right? Like, I think of of project management as kind of an overarching. Uh, you're, you're specialized in in projects, right? To, to to all the things that Rich said, you're not operational. You're there's a beginning and an end, and you you can move from industry to industry. So in that aspect, if somebody has the PMP and and it's in an industry that's not in the person that has the PhD then I would be more interested in hearing what the person who has the PMP says. If the person who has a PhD is in psychology and I'm hiring someone in a field related to psychology, then yeah, I mean, it's the, the PMP is fantastic, but obviously th this person has spent years and years and years perfecting this, this trade. I'm, I'm more going to be impressed by that PhD in psychology. But outside of psychology, the PhD starts to, to lose some of its luster. Whereas the PMP, you know, is more transferable. Awesome, thank you. Amy, I see you're unmuted too. Yeah, no, just to add that I think it just also, just like it was said already, it just depends on the position that you're going for and how relevant um, the degree is to the to the position that you're looking at or wh what you're going for, what kind of job you're going for. Um, really hard to say just in general, but um, just really depends on the, the specific position. Awesome, thank you. Um, Okay, I'll move on to the next question here. Uh, we had another question come in asking if uh, you advise somebody to pursue their CAPM before the PMP. Uh, assumption here is that they don't have the hours required for the PMP yet. Um, so would you advise a, you know, try to get the hours first and then go after PMP or just go after the CAPM? First. Yeah, um, I think it was mentioned uh, earlier, but uh, the certifications are uh, really show that you're dedicated to um, to the profession. You're dedicated to the job that you're doing, um, and you're uh, you're showing that by getting certified at whatever level you're currently at. Um, for people with limited uh, project management experience, but want to continue. Uh, in the project management field, um, the CAPM shows that they might not be an expert or have um, all of the material necessary for a PMP, um, but it shows that they're dedicated and they want to learn. Um, if they wait until they have the bare minimum number of hours, um, sit for their PMP, uh, get their PMP, their resume is going to show relatively limited experience with a disjointed qualification of the PMP. Um, so 
when uh, as a hiring manager reviewing that um, that resume, it would uh, kind of has the potential of not balancing out. But a person with limited experience that has their cap M is showing that they're progressing. They're not trying to present themselves as something they're not. I would say that if you have limited experience, I would recommend that you sit for the cap M um, and then put that on your resume with the experience that you have. I I agree entirely with everything that Rich said. And I, I just want to say that um, I've seen both in my students on campus, uh, my, my undergrads and in um, the, the veterans and family members I worked with at the IBMF, uh, oftentimes folks undersell or don't think they have the hours, but in reality, they do have the hours to sit for the PMP or they're intimidated by taking the PMP exam. So they, even though they have the hours to sit for the PMP, they want to go for the CAPM first because they think um, that'll be an easier list or they're not lift for, or they're not ready for the jobs that PMP will bring. And I would just say in the, then that case, um, really take a good look at your experience and your hours, uh, do that hard self-assessment. If you have the hours to sit for the PMP, uh, don't sell yourself short and go for the CAPM, go for the PMP. Um, but if you, if you really don't have the hours, then the CAPM is valuable in taking that first step into project management. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Uh, we do have another question that came in uh, <laughs> labeled the do drinker. <laughs> um, and uh, the question there is uh, basically, um, as a new project manager, if I take on a role managing construction projects, will that make it hard to later take PM roles uh, in IT, research projects, process improvement projects, et cetera? Uh, are there advantages to having a broad spectrum of project management experience. Amy, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. I think there's a lot of value in having different types of project management experience, especially if you um, want to keep moving up in your career. You're going to need to be able to move around and do different types of projects within your same company, or if you're leaving your current company and moving to another company and then another one after that, you're going to be doing different types of projects. Um, so you need to be prepared and, and willing to be able to take on different types of things um, in order to keep um, having a career progression. Um, that's been my experience. And um, I think that uh, others would have that same type of experience. You need to be able to um, be doing different types of things, maybe not vastly different things. I'm not sure I would ever be able to be a program manager for an, for an IT, IT program, but um, things that you can um, transfer over and use your skills, but still learn some additional, um, gain some additional knowledge and use your program management um, abilities. Um, you should be able to do that and be willing to do that. Awesome, thanks. Rich, I see you're unmuted too. Yeah, I, uh, I completely agree that well-rounded experience is, uh, is beneficial. Um, I would caution against changing industries, you know, going from construction to IT. Um, really, when you're changing industries like that, you, you need to be able to present those transferable skills and to show that those transferable skills outweigh perhaps another uh, more um, greater experience in the industry you're looking to change into. Um, so, in different uh, different projects within your industry, uh, I would say is valuable. But every time you're looking to change industries, you're you're um, going to be challenged by those with more experience in that industry. So I just yeah. want to chime in here real quick that I think it really depends on the organization that you're going to work for as well. Um, in my group, we have six project managers titled as I am, and pretty much every other hire. One is a super technical IT project manager, and one has more general experience from a wide swath of industries um, and background. And neither is more valued, but we do get different kinds of projects. I came in as a more generalist uh, manager and leader into the project management role here. But the expectation has been also that over the um, last several years, I've expanded my learning and I have become very much an IT project manager. and. Um, I've, I've been going to school for that as well. 
I think that that is the expectation. It would be very, very difficult for me to change industries into construction from IT at this point. I would essentially be starting over. But um, but at the same, I don't think that means that I couldn't do it. It would just be a, potentially a step back. Awesome. Joe, I see you're unmuted. Yeah, well, kind of what Dan was saying is it, it it matters where you are in your career. If you are brand spanking new and to, to you know, you just got your PMP, you're, you know, wet behind the ears, ready to, to do something, then get, getting that breath is a great thing. Um, if you're, you know, you've been working in uh, as an IT project manager for 15 or 20 years and you're thinking about moving over to construction, then I would start to hesitate and say, maybe now is not the time to start getting breadth in, in your experience. But, but to, to Dan's point, I like the, the positive outlook. It's not that, that anyone who is you know, at the beginning or end of their career can't switch if that's really what they want to do. You just have to realize that it comes potentially with sacrifice and there, there's implications. I mean, if I see a guy, if, if, if it's a Dan and Rich and Rich has 15 years in IT, and Dan has 15 years in construction, and I'm looking for an IT project manager. I'm very likely going to hire the person that has the IT the IT experience. I'm it's nothing against the, you know the other one. It's just common sense. Awesome. We we do have a few more questions in YouTube. I'm I'm trying to, to pull out the ones that I think are are most relevant. Um, so if you're if you're watching, you did ask a question on there. I'm not like purposely skipping questions. Uh, I'm just I'm trying to figure ones that are uh, askable within the time we have left. Um, I do see one in here. They actually uh, directed towards Rich. Um, and that's basically saying that in the military, um, you may inherit a project uh, with the role that you get assigned to. Uh, you, you know, you're in that role for a set period of time and then you transition out of that role. That project may not have come to completion. Uh, during your time with that role, um, you know how do you how do you reflect that uh, when when you know accounting for I guess your your project management hours and stuff like that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you, the experience that you need to sit for your PMP um, really isn't tied to um, the completion of the project. It's it's tied to your participation in that in that project, whether it's as a project manager, a contributor, um, leading individual aspects of of the project. So all the experience is relevant. Um, all the experience uh, would count towards uh, your your necessary experience to sit for the exam. Awesome. Anything to add from from the others on that one? Okay. Um, and then I just. I think that'll be the last one I introduced from YouTube. There was a question that came in from a gentleman named Tom Cow, uh, and his question was basically uh, figuring out whether to pursue the PMP through uh, O2O VCTP um, versus a, a another uh, going after another DoD SkillBridge uh, program uh, that looks like it's a fellowship opportunity. Uh, my recommendation is that you would reach out to our uh, enrollment team here, um, my Debay. Um, and, and give her more specifics on exactly what that fellowship is and, and things like that. And they should be able to, uh, you know, give you some recommendations and, and things like that. So, um, but I would re reach out to our enrollment team with that. Um, it looks like we have about a minute <laughs> left before one o'clock. Uh, so we, we didn't get through all of our prepared questions, which is uh, good because that'll give us some where to pick up for the next time we, uh, come back to doing uh, project management perspectives, uh, part of our, our career uh, pathway series. Um, I do want to thank, uh, you know, Dan, Amy, Rich, and Joe uh, for your time today uh, on the session. Uh, your, your input was very valuable. Uh, and just looking at the, the dialogue back and forth in YouTube, there's a lot of folks out there who are watching that really appreciated uh, what you guys had to say. Um, so this session will be posted on the IBM FETNet page for future viewing access. Uh, and please feel free to share it with anyone you know who missed it, uh, but you feel would benefit from seeing it.
Um, be on the lookout for upcoming VetNet events. Uh, we're currently looking at doing another employer spotlight in July. Uh, the date and time for that is still being worked out, but uh, you know, keep your eyes open and, and we'll have that out hopefully here in the next few weeks. Um, other than that, uh, again, thanks guys. Really appreciate your time. And I appreciate everybody taking the time of your day to, uh, to watch this. So cheers. Have a good day. Thanks, AJ. Thank, Thank you very much. Everybody. Thanks guys.